this takes a ton of work and that's to be able to understand from where you're drawing your identity mm -hmm. so that will drive everything This is the Money Hole Podcast. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and download. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Matt Mosley. Thanks for being here, man. Thanks for having me. This well, is great. It's kind of fun to hang out and do this together when usually we're, you know, it's very informal and <laughs> having lunch and hanging out and just sharing what's going on in each other's lives. This is kind of cool. It Thanks is for cool. having me. You're welcome. You know, to you. Thank you, man. I appreciate you being here. You know, Matt, you're one of my closest friends, and I'm so grateful to say that, but you also you know, you have so much value because you're you, of what you've done in your career and the people who you've influenced. You, you, you know, a lot of people know you, a lot of people know you as a CEO of a bank. You know, you just recently ran like a 60 mile run. No, 50 K. So it's only 50 miles. Oh, sorry. <laughs> only. And you're a very interesting guy. But one of the things that I know about you, which is why I wanted you to do this with me is your, your wisdom around money. And, you know, when I started this podcast, I didn't really know exactly what I was trying to convey, but I knew that, and I know you know this too, that money is such a point of contention for so many people. You know, they have a scarcity mindset or they think that money's going to solve all their problems. And, you know, being in banking, and although we work in similar industries, we've both seen how money has an impact on people and how people have belief systems that cause them all kinds of problems in their life. And so and one of the first questions I'd love to ask you is what were some of the belief systems that you may have had as a, in your childhood, you know, up around money? Yeah, that's a great question. So growing up, um, we, we went through times of having money and not having as much money. And uh, one of the things that I appreciated about my parents is they always uh, were generous. Mm -hmm. um, and generous people. So that's something that was passed down, you know, to me and to my brother. Um, but honestly, I didn't learn a lot of my, uh, I didn't learn much about money growing up. Um, I really was, you know, not really great with money going right into college and all of that and made a lot of dumb decisions with money in my younger years. And as I got into banking, that's actually where I learned money. Yeah, And it was, I learned, you know, kind of how people use money as a tool, what credit looks like, all those sort of things. I learned that from um, being in lending and looking at what people were doing with their money. Yeah, And so it was kind of interesting. It's a weird way to end up as the CEO of a bank coming from not like strong roots of like fundamental, you know, money management, but just kind of learning it on the job. Yeah, And then from that, like transforming my viewpoint on, you know, money as an object versus money as a, as a power. Yeah. And, you know, you can go into like what that really looks like as far as the power it has over people or the power that it wields when used in the right way. Um, yeah. Well, I'd love to hear you expand on that because, you know, I've been, I don't know how long you've been in banking, 22 years for me in, in mortgage. And I think that that's such an important thing is people learning that money is just an object and learning how to remove their emotions from their decisions with it. Cause I think the emotions is what gets people into trouble. Yeah. So when you say that, like, what, give me some examples of what you mean for how it's a power versus just a tool. Yeah. So it's a power because you can give it power or you can use it for a powerful reasons. So wow. most people give it power over them. Um, and that comes from, a feeling of of lack, like oh, I don't have enough, and so as soon as you focus your attention on trying to get more money, it really. I mean, you can look at that in any situation. It can screw up marriages, it can screw up people's lives, all that, or make people greedy or holding on. But when you allow money to be the focus and the drive that motivates you, um, the whole compass is all screwed up at that point, yeah. and so it leads to some really sad things. You know, there's. 
there's a study, I forget who did it, but it's basically there's a point of diminishing returns with wealth. Like as soon, the more and more money you gain, the you get to a point where it's almost like a bell curve that drops off. Like you get money does create some happiness to a certain level because it allows you to buy things, it allows empowers you to have freedom in certain ways and to provide for yourself, for your family, and increase your lifestyle. But there's a point in time where that each dollar of extra income brings less than a dollar happiness and then less and less to a point where really the more money you have is really irrelevant at that point mm-hmm. and doesn't give you any joy. Yeah. And so um, I've seen people chase that down the other side mm-hmm. and hoping to get the joy that money used to bring them yeah. when they didn't have anything and when they were first coming up. And so it can b- become something that has power over you because you're like focused on just earning, earning, earning. Yeah. Um, but the really cool power that I've seen with money is when people can take that and look and say, okay, what can I do with this that's outward focused? And that's why I have such a heart for generosity and people that are generous. It just, it moves my heart when I see someone take some, take money and go give to a cause that that really um, speaks to them. And so you can use that money in a powerful way at that point. So that's why there's some really incredible stories of people that are extremely wealthy and they give away so much money and they're using that in a powerful way versus hoarding it, lifestyle, those sort of things. It doesn't add any, any power. It, it basically takes your power away. Yeah. And it protects them. Yeah. I think a lot of people that are generous, would say that yes, they get a chance to change the world, mm. you know, change an organization, change people's lives. But the generosity is such a tool to to continually make sure that you're not taking the power, yeah. you know. And so, you know, that's really good. I I was thinking I was I was in San Antonio three weeks ago, as you know, and I was I spoke at an event with my coach, and he's my guru for finances and he just hit 103 million in the bank and he's building this 12,000 square foot house on an island in the middle of Lake Norman in North Carolina. And they're living in a 1700 square foot house on a farm that he bought for his wife. And he's, he's mowing the lawns. He's, you know, scooping cow poop and building chicken coops. I've never seen him this happy. And he told, he told a few of us, he said, I may never move into that house. Yeah. yeah. And the, the longer I've known him, the more money I've seen him get, the less I've seen him spend. And the more I've seen him find fulfillment and joy in the everyday simple things in life. And I actually said that from the front and he asked me in front of everyone, he said, why do you think that is? And I said, I think it's because you have found that the money wasn't what you were after. Yeah. It was just... It was the thing that that pushed you and drove you to stay in the game, yeah. to stay fighting. And now you now you and you know that it doesn't satisfy. And I think that for him, he has also discovered that he loves seeing his money grow. He you know he's a good steward. You know yeah. he's super generous. I think he gave away a couple million dollars last year, and he loves it. Like he's and it's the causes that are near and dear to his heart. I mean, he lost a couple boys. Uh, at birth that were twins because of a heart defect. So he's been giving to this, you know, this heart organization for that type of disease. And, you know, he works with uh, Greg Olson, NFL guy, and they're really close friends. So he's really built up this powerful organization and he's as passionate about that as anything, you know, and if it wasn't for guys like him, I mean, those organizations wouldn't be there. Yeah. So yeah, it's really interesting watching people and learning. And what about, you know, some of the, what are some things that people that are listening to this could do on a practical level? Because not everyone has this quality problem of stewarding wealth. Like they're living yeah. paycheck to paycheck. I mean, I think I saw a stat, you might know this better than me, but I think over 85% of Americans right now are living paycheck to paycheck. Credit card debt last week hit an all time high. You saw that mm-hmm. 17 trillion. So on a graph from the pandemic, it literally goes vertical. Mm -hmm. savings accounts go the exact other way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for people that are finding themselves in that situation, which is a lot of people, you know, what are some practical things that you've learned along the way that they could start to do to deal with how to change? Yeah. Well, 
It's interesting, first off, with that graph that you've seen credit card balances increasing in a time where people have had more money than ever thrown at them yep. through the pandemic. So, which is part of the reason we have inflation, right? There's too many dollars chasing too few goods. So people have had a ton of money, yet they spent through it and they're now on credit cards. Um, and so I think the overarching thing I would say, and this is a hard thing for people to, I mean, this 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 takes a ton of work and that's to be able to understand from where you're drawing your identity. Mm -hmm. So that will drive everything. So if yeah. your identity is revolving around making money or having the nice things or things like that, like if if you really take time and, and think on this and are honest with yourself, if your identity is coming from things that you're spending money on, then you're you're in an identity crisis. Yeah. Like you need wow. to find it, you need to understand who you are and that you have value and your value isn't driven by your bank account. Your, your value isn't driven by the things that you buy. It's driven by who you are as someone that's been created with incredible value and, and, and ability to impact the world around you in whatever your circle looks like. And so I think that is the most important piece here. And then once we know our identity, like I know that I'm not a, C a bank CEO as my identity. That would be super, super discouraging and disappointing if that was my, mm -hmm. like if that was my all in all in life. That's not me. That's what I do. And I love what I do. But I am a husband, a father, a son, a brother, a friend. And I am someone that has purpose and value and I have a ton to give the world. So now moving to money, if I come from that posture mm -hmm. where I know who I am and I don't have doubts and I don't feel like there's some lack that I need to make up, then I can say, okay, now I am earning income and what do I do with that? How do I handle it well? Am I, am I paycheck to paycheck? So let's say I'm putting myself in a perspective of I'm not a bank CEO. I'm you know working at a restaurant, paycheck to paycheck, trying to make ends meet. Okay, so then what do I do mm -hmm. and how do, so I think at that point, then you have to get around someone that has been in your same shoes, like find a mentor, find someone that you can be friends with and start, or that's a couple steps ahead of you and start hanging out with them. Yeah. And you'll start figuring it out for yourself because you can't just say, oh, here's a practical step you need to, you could always say, okay, make a budget pay down your credit card, stop, stop sign buying. Up, sign up for Dave Ramsey. Yeah, 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 yeah. Stop putting pizza on a credit card, you know, be, and paying it off over the course of 25 months, yeah. you know, those sort of things. Like yep. you can say that, but really until we put ourselves around people that will draw out better qualities in us, um, it's, it's going to be really hard to maintain anything yeah. like that. That's really good. So I heard- the first thing I heard you say is a vision for who you are, like really yeah. know. And if you don't know who you are, like really creating that vision mm -hmm. um, for who you want to be. Yeah. And the other thing I heard you say was mentors, people mm -hmm. that can show you the path, inspire you and show you a, a life that you would like to live. That's my story, man. And I think that I told, I was talking to someone recently and I told her, you cannot think your way into right living you have to live your way into right thinking oh that's good and so you got that from me didn't you? i did yes Probably. i did that was yeah. matt mosley by the way <laughs> <clears throat> and so you know what that means is you got to start taking the actions mm -hmm. right it's like for me i remember that there was a time where i would go to the clearance aisle of stores and i did it because i had to and i felt ashamed and i mm -hmm. really wanted to spend i wanted to go to the most expensive stuff and buy it and you know, in the beginning of the process of becoming debt-free and accumulating wealth and getting to a, a better place, that wasn't easy. Now it's fun and I'm proud of it. I love buying a $5 shirt off the rack. I'm not saying I do that on everything. I like quality things just like the next guy. I don't know when you bought a $5 I shirt. I have one it, okay. and I'll show it to you. I'm not <laughs> lying. I have a $5. I just bought it. It's very okay, nice. Great. You would never know it. It looks very expensive. But I think the point is, is my identity is not in those things anymore. If I buy something that's really nice is because I want to enjoy using it. Mm -hmm. It's because it's quality and it's because I can have fun with it with my friends mm -hmm. or my family. I can have a good experience with it. You know, and, and, and so, so yeah, I think that what I'm trying to say is 
we have to learn to take new actions, those things will begin to change our thinking. Mm -hmm. Our thinking will begin to change how we feel about ourselves. And that's how identity can be changed. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, and also having a appropriate expectations for your season in life is really good too. You know, when you're some, some of Anna and I's favorite times were when we were first married, living in this little 400, or it wasn't 400 square foot apartment. It was a little bigger, but we paid $450 it was a 3, month. 3,000 square feet. It was huge. No, really small. But it was amazing. I look back on that. We had nothing and we were so, we had so much fun, yeah. you know? And so, but living in that season and not, you know, something that Dave Ramsey says, and I, which is, I think, incredible is he says, don't try to live the life that your parents live today. Yeah. Like, don't assume that you should already be 30 years down the road mm -hmm. on your financial journey. You know, when you're in your early 20s, know, okay, I'm in my early 20s. What do I have and how am I going to use it well? Yeah. And doing that over and over again is how you create wealth. And a lot of people, they find themselves scrambling and trying to grasp for yeah. more and, and take shortcuts. And that's where you get all these different kind of silly schemes out there and people you know, get sucked into it because they're like, oh, this is going to be the thing that will yeah. get me to the place I need to be. And yeah. it's re in reality, they wasted so much time trying all these shortcuts that if they had just started, you know, being uh, purposeful, you know, with their yeah. finances early, they would have been well past there. Yeah. Because then they have more time and mm -hmm. time is the whole deal with this. And I think the, I don't know who says it, but he, he always says people under they overestimate what they can do in a year, but they underestimate what they can do in 10 years. Yeah. And I think the long-term approach, you know, is what you're saying. I see that a lot with home buyers. A lot of home buyers in the last few years, they are trying to knock it out of the park and buy their dream home as their first house. And it's wise for people to try to see it as a stepping stone. You know, if you know anyone, like I know you've got you've bought a couple houses since I've known you. And would you say that the first three or four were stepping stones to get you where you're at? Yeah, I would say actually the worst deci financial decision I've ever made was trying to reach and do something quickly. Well, so I, the principle that I tell people a lot is whenever you feel like you have to make a quick decision, you're going to make the wrong decision. Mm. Like whenever you feel pressured, like, oh, I'm going to miss out if I don't do this now, you're going to look back like, oh, I should not have done that. So back when Anna and I first got married, we we're living in that little apartment and we knew we wanted to buy a house or build a house or something. Well, this was back when home values were going up and it was really tough to reach and, and to buy a house. And we found a lot that we could buy and build a house. Mm -hmm. And so we scraped and pushed and leveraged ourselves and got into this house. And because we felt like if we don't do it now, that we're going to miss the boat and we're going to be even that much further down the road by the time we you know are ready. And so we ended up building at the height of the market and, you know, ended up with a house that was worth less than, you know, it upside cost down. to build yeah. upside down. And we ended up losing money on that house when we sold it. And it was like, it was a good learning experience yeah. for me because it, it was early on realizing, okay, when I try to go too fast, I'm going to make a mistake. But yep. then after that, then we bought a smaller house. Uh, in Reading, and we had a great time in that house, just joyful memories. And then we bought a, another house that was a little bit farther along, and then another house. And, you know, so we're, you know, we've been several houses in now at this point. And yeah, they've all been stepping stones. Yep. And I love where we live now. Yep. And I love where we lived in our, in that, that, um, that second house where we kind of reset. Like that was great memories there. So I learned a lot in them. Yeah. So, what you were saying, one of the things that I saw this week was discipline is freedom and our moody, our moodiness and our emotions leads to slavery. Hmm. And I, I really think about that a lot. I think that any time in my life where I've been impulsive, I had to have something or I pushed something that I didn't have the peace for just because I wanted to have it, man, it just never turned out good. I remember, and I've shared this with you before, but I was at a conference 15 years ago and this guy said to receive things, not to take them. Hmm. And I don't necessarily say I always receive things. I still, but anytime I try to fight to grab something, it just doesn't feel right. Even if it works out, I feel, I don't feel the joy of it. If I bought the house, I'm not feeling great about it. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good point. So 
one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about, you know, you and I are in the financial industry and so many people right now in 2023 are full of fear. In fact, I've told my whole team recently, our job is not what it used to be. Our job is managing fear. Mm. That's our job right now. And, you know, most people, they get their information from the media or they get their information from their friend who watches the media and they don't even think twice about it. Like they just let that information come in yeah. and it becomes the reality and the mindset and it influences belief systems that they have or creates new ones. What are your thoughts about that? Because I know that you are super in tune with what has been happening in the banking world, what's been happening with the debt ceiling. And you've seen these things before and you're always so even keeled and focused on the probabilities. So what, what would you say to people that are you know, listening to those things and experiencing so much fear this year? Yeah. Well, I would say, um, first off, you have to look at your source of relevant information. Like, okay, so is my information source, am I drinking water from a bad well? And is it making me sick? And so you look at your news source, am I taking in information that is helping me make rational decisions and is keeping me, um, you know, pretty even keel and under, being able to have perspective on the world or on whatever situation um, you know is at hand at that point? Or am I taking in information that's making me feel like, uh-oh, I need to, something's going to change. I need to do, like, is it bringing anxiety or is it bringing peace? Yeah. And so that's, and I'm not saying that social media is bad or any of these, you know, news outlets are bad or anything like that, but but if they're causing you anxiety, then you need to ask yourself, why am I watching this? Yeah. And people, a lot of people say, oh, well, I want to be informed. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're drinking from a bad well, you're drinking yeah. from a nasty source that's just going to make you sick. And so I, so for me, I do, li I listen to, you know, Bloomberg and I listen to NPR and I listen to Fox. I, I listen to all like a whole spectrum of things to be informed. Yeah. I also don't want to give anything power over me. I don't want to give something the ability to make me scared mm -hmm. because really what I'm doing at that point is I'm handing over the control of my own emotions and my own life. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give this person that's, you know, that's making me not feel good about myself. I'm going to allow them to do that more. Like that's just silly. And so for me, like I like to have, um, I like to, to be able to be open-minded to information, but I also want to make sure that I have enough wisdom to process the information on my own. Yeah, and uh, and part of that is uh, for the last gosh, I would say fifteen years, but I think it's been even longer. Every single day, I ask God for wisdom beyond my years. Yep, because I know that I'm not smart enough in and of myself, or have the proper perspective to be able to decipher information and make good decisions. Like yeah. I, I know I have a ton of limitations on that. And so I know I need help. And so, but, the, but I, that discipline of doing that every single day or every work day, I don't know if I do it on the weekends, but um, every single day has really benefited because it's caused me, it's allowed me to have peace. Mm. And so I think you make better decisions when you're, when you're at a place of peace and not to say I don't get freaked out. I don't get scared. Don't deal with anxiety. Like it definitely happens. Like, don't get me wrong. I just, but I find that if I can return to that place of peace quicker and the less time I live in that anxiety world, like the better I can make decisions, the better perspective yeah. I'll have. And so when I talk to, or when I think about fear, I think about, well, what's going to have control over me? What am I going to hand control over to? If I find myself in a moment of fear, um, do I want to take control back and say, okay, well, let's have perspective, or do I want to allow that fear to dictate my next move? Yep. And so with finances, like my bad decision I made with that house, like I let fear of missing out dictate my next move and I paid a price for it. FOMO. FOMO for sure. <laughs> uh, FOMO for show. Sure. <laughs> a lot of people lose money from FOMO. I'm one of yeah. them. You know, I was talking to a guy this week. And he's trying to buy a house. He's a really close friend of mine, and and I love this guy. And can you seven, name him right now? His name was no, Matt Mosley. <laughs> just kidding. No, about seven years ago, he was in contract to buy a property, and right towards the end, he said that God told him not to buy the house. 
And, you know, now he's like just scrapping to try to get into a property. And one of our, one of our mutual friends had told me that they had a conversation and he said, that was fear. Mm -hmm. That was fear that caused me to cancel. And you said that fear controls people. It does, man. Mm -hmm. It's like, if you have a financial planner who's telling you that we have models that we follow that have worked for a hundred years and you want to call them because your friend told you that China and Russia and India are creating bricks and they're going to destabilize the dollar and you need to get all your money out. Like that is fear controlling yeah. you. Yeah. And that is why people lose money. And the, the, the sad part about fear is when it comes to money is that whatever your greatest fear is, it'll happen, mm -hmm. but usually you create it. Wow. Because our problems yeah. are our own making oftentimes, right? And mm -hmm. and I think the hard the sad part is that so many people don't realize that. And I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I don't know it's is you know, if it's because they just don't have friends that are telling them the truth or they don't have good advisors in their life. It's probably yeah. a lot of different things. Yeah. But you know, that's something I always want people to realize because I've learned it myself and you have too, that you gotta find a way to live a life with no fear. Yeah. And you know, for me, faith is the opposite. Yeah. Well, and the way, the other thing about that is I'm glad you hit on this is uh, who do you give a voice in your life to? Yeah. And that's so one of the things you look at too. Like, you know, if you tell me, Hey Matt, this is something I'm concerned about, or, you know, we're talking about it and you raise a concern that uh, in, from my life, you have a voice in my life. You can tell me that stuff yeah. and I listen, but not everybody has that. Right. I don't listen to a lot of people. <laughs> That's not because I don't care or anything like that, but it's because I. you have to choose whose voice you're going to value. Yep. And unfortunately, like kind of where we started is a lot of like news sources and stuff, people that are, you know, really struggling with fear are, they're valuing the news sources uh, voice into their life. And they don't even know these people, you know? And so yep. they just allow so much of that to, to dictate and control. And as it, comes to to money you know you we need good advisors around us like yeah. there's a I don't, i'm horrible at quoting verses but there's a verse in proverbs from the bible that talks about like good advice a, a wise man has many yeah. advisors uh, and so you you want to have good quality people helping you as you're deciding to to make a move financially or pay down something or how you're going to deploy your cash. Are you going to pay down debt? Are you going to ex invest in something that's supposed to expand? Like you need people around you that yeah. you can talk to about it. People that have a proven record. Yeah. And that, you know, they have fruit in their life. You that's know, because, a great point. Because there are a lot of people right now that are giving people financial advice that don't have any. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, the stats are crazy, especially on social media. Yeah. There's so much of that. You know, the other thing is about fear around money is I don't talk about my, if I do have fear around it, I do talk to like you and the other, and the reason why is because that stuff spreads. And I know I have a lot of friends and they ask me a lot of questions and like I, I could say something of, out of a concern and all of a sudden throw my friends into a tailspin. So I also like to talk to friends that are stable and rational. And, you know, so I think that as you are, the longer you're in this journey, there's a lot of reasons why you need to have the right people yeah. because you don't, you don't want to spread that fear because yeah. fear seems to spread. It's prevalent. It's everywhere you go. People are talking about it and, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, true. I want to go back to identity because the reason that, that that I'm doing this podcast is because there are so many people out there that want to deal with the symptoms of a deeper problem. And you nailed it so well when you talked about identity. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self um, on how to establish the man you are today sooner so that you could have avoided some of the pitfalls? Wow. I think if you really spend time asking yourself, okay, who am I and who do I want to become? Having a vision for your future is is huge. And for me, I can't derive identity outside of my um, identity as a child of God, as, as someone that has deep, deep value. And so I think that's, so step one if I could go back to my 20 year old self, first off, I would say, Hey, settle down, you knucklehead. <laughs> and, um, also step two, you're going to meet Anna soon and you're, that'll be great. Um, but no, the real thing would be, uh, to just go back and say, spend time figuring out who you are 
where your what you value you bring to the world mm. and who do you want to become and let that be your guiding light beyond anything else any other circumstances that come that's really good man well i appreciate you thank you i really appreciate you having me on this has been a lot of fun awesome please make sure to like subscribe and download and thanks for being with us today 